Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from a cold, a question mark, Macomb, Illinois. Uh, it's April 20th, and we're having snow, and it's going to be freezing in the 20s tonight as we're recording this. So that's great. Uh, and so, but we do have a great show for you today, listeners and viewers. Uh, we are going to be talking with CED, or that's Community and Economic Development Educator, Carrie McKillop. She's with Extension. Uh, so we are going to be talking about disasters, landscape disasters. And I'm not talking about when you plant the rose sideways. I'm talking about when an actual natural or human disaster comes your way, what happens. So before we get to Carrie, though, let's introduce our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by Katie Parker, local foods educator in Adams County. Hi, Katie. Hey, Chris. Is your snow melted yet? It's all melted. And it was like, uh, it was just like a poetic beauty this morning when I woke up. The trees were covered and the lawn area was covered, but every lawn underneath the tree was bright green. And I snapped some pictures of that after our podcast last week with Wendy. I'm all into some photography right now. So uh, yeah, I, I thought it was beautiful this morning. How about yeah, yourself? It was. I was surprised to see that it stuck so much and it stuck around pretty much until lunchtime. Uh, but now we're just back to our, our normal green grass. That's just normal, boring green grass. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know it. And I know another person who's disappointed to just be staring at normal, boring green grass is Ken Johnson, horticulture educator in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello. So my kids went out and made some snowballs this morning, and I don't know if any got thrown, but they did bring some inside <laughs> to show me. <laughs> it seemed like it was a good packing snow. Yeah, nice and wet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, Ken, hopefully you and Becca didn't get pelted with snowballs or something when you're in a Zoom meeting. So that's, that's yeah, we had, safe. We had master gardener training. They would have been in some big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I was there. <laughs> um, so, uh, Ken, Katie, are you worried about your plants outside with this like pretty random uh, dip into cold weather here uh, in April? So for the most part, I'm not, there's a few plants we've covered. Our strawberries are starting to bloom. So I covered those. Those can take, you know, into below 30 is fine. But since we're getting down and lower into the 20s, I covered, couldn't cover all of them. We've got too many, but covered some patches uh, that had open flowers and, and a lot of buds. So hopefully we get some strawberries. And then uh, our peonies <clears throat> started to have, started developing flower buds. So I covered those two just to be on the safe side. But everything else is going to, just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> Hey, Katie, do you have any frost protection going on in your yard? Uh, so most of our stuff, it they're kind of more of your hardy perennials, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, I did have some, um, I planted my strawberries that Ken gave me uh, in a pot, and so I brought those in our garage, um, and so they're safe there. And then I have some flats of some plants that I'm starting as well, and so I brought those into our garage as well. So. Um, Yep, just keeping them in where it's warm and they don't have to face being cold. What about you, Chris? Uh, yeah, I'm about in the same boat. I'm, I'm not too, I don't care. I don't know how to put this. Um, I, I don't care as much for the perennials that I know are going to be fine. Maybe they're going to get their flower buds nipped a little bit. Uh, but I, I'm not too concerned about them. Now I did, like I, like you, Katie, I had some flats of veggies and things I brought back into the garage. And of course the tomatoes and peppers, all that, that those are in the basement you know, under lights. And so, uh, so I'm taking care of those, making sure they're protective of everything else. Yeah, it's on their own. I think uh, I, my wife's like, go out and cut the tulips that we have and mm -hmm. put them in a vase just because she wants to enjoy the, the last of those flowers. So I, I guess, is there any way, I, I know the big question was tree fruit, at least in my neck of the woods yesterday, what to do about tree fruit. Is there any way to tell what kind of damage we might expect with uh, our, our tree fruit, Ken? So you can look at some of those flowers that you have and kind of pull them apart um, and look in that, <clears throat> that pistil area. And if that's a kind of brown or black, those flowers are, are pretty much dead. You're not going to get fruit off of those. So a lot of it's going to be, you're going to have to go out and test, and it's going to be kind of a wait and see, um, see how cold it actually gets. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the stuff, you know, you can get down to the 30s, upper 20s, and you'll get minimal kills when you start getting real cold. You know, 
mid twenties that you start seeing 90 some percent kill on flowers. So a lot of it's going to be a little bit of a wait and see and see how cold it actually gets. And we'll know, you know, a couple of days after, if not a couple hours after, hmm. if you start going out and checking flowers and stuff to see if they're still viable. Well, I guess, you know, we could leave a link to a chart that diagrams that pretty specifically about timing, flowering, and then kind of that threshold minimum temperatures that they can survive so that folks might help them also determine what might recover after this dip into, into the freeze. But speaking of unpredictable weather uh, and getting into kind of the, uh, the disaster side of things, well, I don't think this is necessarily a disaster. It's definitely unexpected and just calls to what it's like to live here in Illinois. Uh, we must introduce our special guest today, Carrie McKillop, Community and Economic Development Educator with U of I Extension. Hi, Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. So with Extension, we have like, you know, we're like spokes on a wagon wheel. We go in a lot of different directions with the program areas that we cover, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken and I are horticulture, Katie does local foods, small farms. Now you do community and economic development, you know, for short, we say CED. Um, and so, Tell me a little bit about uh, the CED team and, and your role as an educator out here in uh, West Central Illinois. Yeah, and, and community and economic development is a, is a wide area. We do everything from um, working with individual businesses to leadership training to community planning, um, lots of different things. Um, across the state. And luckily, I work with a great uh, team that we have expertise in different areas. And so if I need to know something from um, someone else throughout the state, I can, can always call upon them. But here in West Central Illinois, I focus a lot on, um, I do some customer service training and some um, uh, training for businesses and, and dealing with people in different generations. But a lot of the stuff that I do are participatory planning processes um, to help community groups really think through how they want to develop a plan, whether it be strategic planning, whether it be an organizational uh, strategic plan, um, mitigation planning. Um, also, I do disaster planning for not-for-profits and for businesses as well. Um, working with them to identify their risks and come up with an action plan uh, to make sure that they can survive a disaster as best as possible. And especially the not-for-profit community. Um, oftentimes the clientele that they serve are the most directly impacted by disasters. So you do a lot of work on disaster preparedness and response. What type of disasters do we need to be looking out for in West Central Illinois? Well, you know, there are a lot of natural disasters and a lot of man-made disasters. Um, so typically when we think about disasters in West Central Illinois, we focus on the weather-related disasters like flooding, tornadoes, um, straight line winds. It, it's really funny. Everybody wants to, they can't wait to say they had a tornado when a straight line wind can be just as damaging as we mm -hmm. all learned new terminology last year from the derecho just north of us. Um, but, but there are lots of different things, you know, a, a, a blizzard in the winter time um, or an ice storm. Right after I started working for extension, we had a horrible ice storm in uh, 2007 that literally shut down West Central Illinois. I mean, you literally could go nowhere. Um, so there are a wide array kind of weather disasters that we try to prepare people for. And then there are always the man-made disasters. I mean, if, if you think about the number of uh, trains that go through West Central Illinois, um, whatever cargo they may be carrying that, that could be hazardous, whether it be um, a chemical spill, um, waste spills, those kind of things, oil spills can, can constitute a disaster. So we generally talk to people about sort of an all hazards approach to think about disaster preparedness, what to do if you need to evacuate, what you need to do if you need to shelter in place, and then what, what to do um, if you are just uh, needing to seal a room. 
and mm -hmm. and uh, decontamination and and those kinds of things. So so we try to think about things in terms of what the action is, um, as opposed to the actual disaster. So you've kind of hinted at this, but what are some different ways you've worked with kind of individual communities and in preparing for different disasters? Well, and, and so we, we do um, action plans for businesses and for not-for-profits, but we also can help communities and, and counties put together what's called their multi-jurisdictional uh, hazard mitigation plan, natural hazards mitigation plan. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency requires that all communities or jurisdictions have a FEMA-approved a multi -jur or jurisdictional uh, mitigation plan in order to access hazard mitigation dollars from the federal government, mm -hmm. which can cover things like repairing roads or mitigating um, a parking lot. When we talk about mitigating, what we're talking about is anything that we can do to reduce the risk to life and property from a, a natural hazard. So if you think of things like elevating a, a, a house out of the base flood elevation, um, remo removing a house from uh, the floodplain and relocating it to a uh, less disaster prone area, there are lots of different ways that we can talk about mitigation. Um, some of the things that we've been talking about now with some of the increased precipitation is infrastructure improvements for um, some systems that were developed in uh, previous development times, such as watershed enhancements, um, things like uh, expanding the size of culverts under some of the roads. I mean, there, there are lots of different things that we can do to reduce the risk of, of roads overtopping, of houses getting flooded. Um, and even as simple of things, and I say simple, but you guys are the experts of, on this, but but pruning our trees. I mean, we live in the Midwest. We know we're going to have thunderstorms, right? So how do we take care of our trees to make sure that we don't have branches falling down on our houses? Um, all of those kinds of things can be considered mitigation activities. So we help communities and counties think about those kinds of things as well. We also encourage counties to put together what's called a COAD or a community organizations active in disaster group. And they don't actually do response to disasters, but they can be a first step in helping communities recover. Things like um, volunteer management, emergency shelter, donations management, all of those kind of things that groups and organizations can do to assist the community in recovering from a disaster. Um, Adams County is a very good example of a really active, good uh, uh, co-ed. We have a co-ed in Henderson County here along the Mississippi River. And then we work a lot with the Quad Cities, um, the ready, disaster ready Quad Cities, which is the co-ed that serves both Rock Island County, Illinois and Scott County, Iowa. And, and so really thinking about the things that need to happen in a disaster or after a disaster to help the community recover. And so we, we try to do as much as we can to help people prepare for those activities. You know, you, you're, you're talking and you had mentioned about, um, you know, like expanding culvert size and, and uh, you know, pruning trees and uh, flooding and I, I just got thinking, I know that, that you and you have team members also that work with green infrastructure. That is, that is disaster mitigation. I never necessarily thought about it like that. I thought it was like infrastructure improvement, but not necessarily disaster mitigation. Well, and if you think about it, the, the uh, strips that they're putting now, in, and you guys probably know the names of those better than I, that in fields that actually help absorb some of the water and keeping it from running off into our streams. It, it also mm -hmm. helps keep some of the, the nutrients on the, on the cropland as well. You know, all of those kind of things, if, if we truly think about going back to some of the simple that make things more attractive as well, you know, some of those uh, strips and, and those kinds of things that, that are just practical and low maintenance for 
um, communities and organizations that are having to maintain uh, our systems and drainage districts and, and those kind of things. The, the more we can reduce this runoff and speed that water enters our drainage systems, the less likely we are to have uh, roads over top, to have flash flooding, all of those kinds of things that cause damage to, to life and property. So, so trying to think holistically on what we can do as communities, as, as property owners, as communities, as organizations, whatever we can do to keep people safe and to keep property safe is, is sort of the definition of mitigation. Yeah, I, the old engineer mantra, the stormwater way, the, the way to handle stormwater runoff, uh, treat it as a nuisance, collect, convey, discharge. Uh, it's, I, I, have, I know engineers, I have some engineer friends, and uh, they're wonderful people, but I'm glad we are uh, kind of pulling away from that method of dealing with stormwater, because we can use it as a resource and it doesn't have to be a nuisance. Well, and, and also, if you think of some of the other um, issues that we face in the Midwest with decreasing water tables and that kind of stuff, the more water we can keep on our properties and letting it absorb to recharge those water tables is, is probably also going to be good for us in the long run as well. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I, it, I've seen like Peoria County, I believe, and I think our producer, Wendy Ferguson, mentioned this uh, before, is that they actually have incentive programs for people to do stormwater infrastructure on their properties in the form of rain gardens, and rain barrels and such. So, yeah, that that might be coming down the pipeline for a lot of us, even in rural Illinois, where you think well, we don't have a problem with that. But uh, you just wait for that next drought to come along and all of a sudden it becomes it becomes very apparent. And yes, Wendy just messaged us. Yes, they they get a break on their water bill. So well, I'd, be and, I'd be up for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. Um, but, but, you know, if you really think about it in terms of sustainability and, and all of those things that, that we're doing and, and some of our practices um, trying to, to get back to a more holistic approach and, you know, there, there's all sorts of things from field runoff and those kind of things that if we can keep uh, water absorbing onto uh, farmland, we, we also keep some of those fertilizers and those kind of things in place instead of in the, you know, the runoff mm -hmm. scenario. And I suspect that if you talk to any of the, the people that I've met over my years that, that work in the dewatering uh, drainage districts along the Mississippi River, they'd just as soon us, you know, keep our water uh, where we are, <laughs> yeah. as opposed to sending it down to them. Keep your gross water where you're at, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, I mean, we get, in terms of natural disasters, I mean, we get possibly tornadoes, really bad thunderstorms, as you mentioned. Um, what about preparedness for us at home? Uh, you know, I, I remember as a kid talking about kits. Is that something that every house should have? Uh, I, and, and I have one at home, but I've had it for a long time. Do I need to update these things? You, what, what are some advice on kits? You might want to check the the uh, expiration date on your granola bars that you might have in there. Um, and the ibuprofen I know is expired in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that if you happen to keep triple antibiotics stuff in your emergency mm -hmm. kit with children, you probably should. Um, mm -hmm. You might want to check the expiration date on that as well. But but typically, you know, one of the things that that is a misnomer is that people think that, oh, if there's a disaster, you know, there's going to be this big rush to help us and that, you know, everything will be back together really soon. FEMA will come and rescue mm -hmm. us. You know, that is not the reality. And especially um, we need to think about practicalities in rural Illinois. Most of the time, uh, unless the disaster is the tornado is some, something like Joplin, we're not even going to get a federal disaster declaration. Yeah. So having enough food, water to get by for 24 to 72 hours is probably a good idea. If you can squirrel away a little bit of cash, that's also a good idea because, you know, most of us, you know, it, we don't keep cash because we use plastic for everything, mm -hmm. right? We use our debit card. Well, if there's no power, you're probably not going to be able to get yeah. cash and the cash registers aren't going to be working at stores. So just having, and I'm not suggesting you have 
tons of cash around. But I only keep it in my mattress. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, but but you may need to run to the gas station and get some ice, right? They may have a generator if you're if you're trying to keep something cold if it's in the summer. Um, you know those kinds of things. So keeping that in mind, making sure that you have water. Um, drinking water and then also if you know a storm's coming it doesn't hurt to fill some buckets or fill your bathtub uh, full of water because guess what gravity works and you can mm -hmm. always use that to flush your toilet so if you um don't have water or if if you're on a pump you know um i've lived in rural areas where you're well if you if you don't have electricity you don't have water so, you know, making sure that you think about all of those risks that you might have. The other thing to think about is in case of a tornado, do you have a family plan? Do you know, does everybody in your house know where to go if a tornado comes? You know, I have a split for your house. Now I may have to drag all my yarn out of my yarn closet under the stairs. Save but, the yarn. But, save the yarn. So, but, uh, you know, underneath a closet underneath the stairs, is a very safe place because of the structural integrity of a, a stairs. If you don't happen to have that, if you're in a ranch house on a slab, getting in a bathtub with pillows or a mattress or anything on top of you, um, just to keep from falling debris, the, the structure of the bathtub should help um, if, if something were to fall on the house. But to just think about where the safest place in your house might be in the event of, of a tornado or straight line winds. Your roof can come off in the straight line winds as well. What are some steps that we can take to prepare for the disasters we commonly encounter here in the Midwest? Well, and having that emergency kit, um, the other thing that we don't talk about a lot when we talk about disaster preparedness is like a fire that could happen at your house. And that is the number one disaster that most people would face. And so talking, sitting down and talking to your family, having a, a uh, congregation spot outside of your house in the, the corner of your yard or across the street so that everybody knows where they're supposed to meet up, but also what's the safest way to get out of any particular part of your house. You know, are your bedrooms on the second story? Is there a, a roof, a window that they could get out? Making sure you have multiple points of exit. If you have children, making sure they know what to do should the smoke alarm go off, um, those kind of things. I, I think that's something that we don't talk about. We always think of the worst case disaster and, and what to do in the event of a major weather disaster, but just simply have being ready for a fire in our house. Do you have fire extinguishers? You know, in the, in the event that um, a, a fire starts on the stove in the kitchen, um, those kinds of things, and communicating that with our children. It's a lot less scary if they know that you're prepared. Make sure your smoke detectors are working. Mm -hmm. Yes. There was a very tragic story about that recently in the local news. So it was could have been predict, predict, prevented, uh, they think, but they didn't have smoke detectors working in the house. And, and keep in mind that, that the Red Cross does provide smoke detectors. Um, so if you can if you are looking for an opportunity to volunteer periodically throughout the year fire departments and the red cross will partner up and and offer to give you a smoke detector and install it for you and show you how to change the batteries so that's something that that everyone should have smoke detectors and hopefully also carbon monoxide detectors mm -hmm. um, installed and and if they don't you know, they can call extension. We will get them funneled through to the Red Cross so that they can can uh, get on a list to get those free smoke detectors. All right. Next for a disaster we don't typically think of in Illinois, um, but earthquakes. So not, and again, that's something we, we commonly think of or occur in Illinois. But is this something we should be uh, thinking about here in central Illinois? Well, we should definitely be thinking about it. I don't know that we should worry about it, so to speak, but, you know, we are um, near the New Madrid fault line, um, which is a very significant uh, seismic plate, um, and it, it really runs through Missouri and, and just south of Illinois, 
but then we're also wedged also between that and the Wabash fault line, which um, kind of goes at an angle to the New Madrid fault line. And what, what you need to keep in mind is the longer it is between um, significant seismic events on those fault lines that um, the, the pressure can build up. The last time that, that the New Madrid fault line has had a significant earthquake, I believe was in 1811 or 1812. Um, and that event was enough, you know, there wasn't a lot of population in this area at that time, but it, that earthquake rang bells in Washington, DC, and it changed the course of the Mississippi River. So if you think of the magnitude it would take to do that, um, that is going to have some serious implications for the infrastructure, both across the Mississippi uh, River and up into Illinois, Missouri, um, in those areas. So, so just being aware that there could be disruptions in transportation, in um, being able to cross rivers at a certain level, certain seismic level, and, and I can't quite tell you exactly what that is, um, the, the Illinois Department of Transportation will shut down all bridges and overpasses until they can be inspected, which is great. You don't want people driving on or under those, right? Um, <laughs> and, and until they've been inspected, but, but that does significantly um, curtail transportation. The other thing to be aware of is that there are a lot of gas natural gas and oil pipelines that come up through the New Madrid uh, fault zone. They're coming from the Gulf of Mexico, um, basically to um, about Centralia, Illinois is, is where a lot of those refineries are. And should a uh, disaster or should an earthquake impact those in the winter time, there could be some disruptions in natural gas service. And most of us do most of our heating through natural gas. So, you know, thinking, thinking of that and, and what we might want to do to be prepared should some of that happen. Um, we do have um, a significant metropolitan area north of um, Centralia that, that takes a lot of power in the wintertime to, to keep warm. So, you know, thinking about what we might do should um, we run out of natural gas in the, the uh, wintertime, can people, you know, congregate together and, and use less gas just to preserve it in, in, until those infrastructures can be circumvented and, and reestablished. Yeah, that, that resource crunch, I mean, even with our current disaster, the, the pandemic, um, right. we're feeling that in a lot of different sectors, even with plants and horticulture, it's hard to find a lot of different plants. So you think you mentioned before the, the show care, you couldn't find tomatoes last year. And yeah. I, that's why I've bought mine. They're in my garage in case it freezes. But yeah, yeah, and, and it is. And, and I think most of us have noticed when we go to the grocery store, even yet, there are empty spots on the shelves and, yeah. and um, you know, our, our, our whole infrastructure uh, has shifted a bit uh, because of, of the pandemic and, and some of the challenges in food production and, and, and workers and, and such in those areas. And so if you think about the, the resources and, and those pipelines being another kind of distribution network and, and resource, so we, we are pretty dependent on our um, infrastructure in the United States to get us the kinds of things we've been accustomed to. Well, that was a lot of great information and very much, I, I after speaking with you, Carrie, I really want to go home and I want to like make sure that I'm prepared. We got to go through our fire plant, got to check the smoke detectors. <laughs> I got a lot of work to do. Uh, carbon tonight. monoxide. Um, got to get the carbon monoxide because we have a gas. We, we, we did not have natural gas in my last houses, but this one we do. So mm -hmm. it, that's a whole new world for me. Yeah. And carbon monoxide did Detectors, you can put them in outlets low to the floor because carbon mm -hmm. monoxide sinks. Yeah. So just so everybody knows that those are good to have if you don't mm -hmm. have children that will mess with them. <laughs> Mine will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we are also a question and answer show. And so what we've actually done this week is we have uh, compiled a couple of questions that came in from actual disasters that have occurred in Illinois uh, that people contacted our extension offices with. And 
so Carrie, would you mind reading us these questions from the past and, and maybe answering these can uh, help folks out that might be listening presently or in the future? Absolutely. I, you know, following the, the big November tornadoes in, in Washington, Illinois in 2013, there were a lot of people that had debris like glass, nails, insulation in their yards. How could they clean that out of the lawn successfully and safely? So that, that was a question um, our educator, Rhonda Faree, who's retired since then, um, she kind of fielded that out to the rest of us uh, educators like, hey, does anybody have any good suggestions for this? And this is a really difficult question to, to answer. There's not a good solution for this, really. Um, you know, having been in a tornado myself, I, there, there is debris everywhere. I mean, insulation, drywall, uh, plasters, just stuff is scattered all over the place. And when it gets in the lawn and the soil, you know that you have nails there, you have glass, you have sharp objects, you have things that could cut your feet, that could hurt you, you know, flatten the mower tire, you know, you name it. So how do you clean that out? You know, we, we did not have any good tips, uh, like 100% uh, making sure it's all remedied is you scrape off that top couple inches of soil and you replace it with fresh, clean fill. Uh, I don't think, I mean, maybe some people could do that, but I don't think many uh, homeowners would be willing to pay that cost because it would be very expensive to do. Um, it would be a lot of work too. You lose a lot of plant material and such. Uh, you know, power raking could be a thing where you can actually rent or, or buy like a power rake to go through the yard and, and rake out the material and, and put it in buckets and then get it in the dumpster. Uh, you know, going around with the magnet like the roofers do and making sure that you get at least the metal bits and nails and things like that. Um, but the glass is kind of a tough one to, to hit to deal with other than totally, you know, digging up the top few inches of soil. I don't know, Ken and Katie, is there any, I, I can't think of anything else that might be useful. Am I leaving something out? Other than maybe a lawn vacuum, unless that's what you're talking about with a lawn rake, those are called those are the same thing, but I don't think so. I think I think they're different. <laughs> I haven't used either, so I couldn't. Okay, I know I the power rake. Oh, like what you said, yeah, the lawn vacuum. I know we've used like a power rake to get a lot of times gravel out of the yard, mm -hmm. um, and so that could help with glass. And in Las Vegas, they use vacuums on their astroturf out there because they don't need to mow it, but they do need to vacuum it. We have some land in the river bottoms that's been flooded uh, two years in my lifetime. Um, and I feel like this is a similar process. Like we spent weeks cleaning mm -hmm. up debris out of the fields. Uh, and so it's just kind of a tedious process. Like you said, with glass, it, that's something that's a little more dangerous because uh, it can be sharp and cut yourself. But uh, if you have big enough things, you could potentially walk your yard quite a bit and pick stuff up. And this is just kind of a wild question, but would a thatcher work where you're trying to get the, the thatch out of your yard? Could you kind of do that and then vacuum it and get up some of it? I don't think and so. That's an you know, uneducated question. So no, but a, so like a dethatcher, that is it is not a power rake, but it's very similar to a power rake. I think they like you know, it's dethatcher has these vertical spinning tines that like flail around like crazy and uh, beat up your your lawn. It's supposed to pull the thatch out. Um, so then you could then rake out the the thatch. So yeah, you could get some debris loosened up and, and rake that out like that. Well, following the Taylorville tornado in 2018, um, someone had called and asked about a large tree partially down in the backyard and who could help clean up that tree and how do they know if it can be saved? Uh, so I'd say that probably you'd want to contact a, a certified arborist uh, to figure that out. Um, so the International Society of Arboriculture has a kind of a process people go through there's testing and all that uh, to become a certified arborist and so you know those people have gone through you know this training they should know what they're talking about um, and you can go to the treesaregood.org website and you can put in your zip code and find arborists in the area um, one thing i would say you know after a tornado something like that there's going to be all kinds of people wanting help with trees so it may take um, a little while and you know, if it's in an area that, you know, it's not posing a hazard to you or your house, um, you're probably going to be put towards the bottom of the list. So just kind of be prepared for that. Um, 
you know, if you've got a chainsaw and it's safe to do, you could potentially cut that up yourself. Um, you know, talk with neighbors to see if they can help you. But you know, if there's any kind of hanging branches that you can't reach or anything like that that poses a hazard, I would stay away from that and wait till you can get some kind of professional out there that's got the the proper equipment and experience to kind of clean all of that up. You know, Christopher, Katie, if you have any other ideas on that. You know, I'd, I'd say if your feet have to leave the ground when using a chainsaw, that's when you got to call a professional because they're trained how to how to do that. Because it's it's a bit different when you're dangling in a tree trying to cut on it as opposed to being on the ground. Um, I, I also do know so like the some of the recent ish um, see it was the uh, the winter storm that went through Texas that deep freeze that they had. Um, you know, we saw news stories of all kinds of uh, good Samaritan plumbers and carpenters coming down to help out. The same thing happens with arborists. So, um, you know, you, you, they, they will be arborists that will travel to uh, towns that have been hit by a disaster and they will help out uh, folks. Now, there, you have to be careful because in talking with the, the former uh, city of Davenport, Iowa's uh, forester, their city forester, he said, they would get a lot of fly by nights too. So people coming in, knowing that there was money to be made um, and people who were desperate, you know, and so they would charge a lot of money. Sometimes they would not show up at all, or sometimes they would do a very bad job uh, what they're doing. So um, if you're working with someone and it is kind of a, uh, you can't look anything up, there are a few things to check. So one, ask if they're insured and you can see proof of insurance. Any good arborist will carry that in their uh the cab of their truck. Are they a certified arborist? Uh, you can ask them that and they would have a certificate to show for that as well. Uh, and then you can always ask for references. Um, so they should have references in their hometown, wherever they're from, that you can just check on uh, to make sure that they're going to do a good job. Uh, and They were not going to try to pull one over on you. Also, after a large scale disaster, there are some um, national voluntary organization active for disasters that have chainsaw brigades that will come in. So if you're in a community that has a large scale disaster, they have people that are trained on chainsaws to come in. And if you can be patient enough to wait for those, um, they, they typically don't just put um, chainsaws in the hands of people <laughs> who, who are not trained and they actually Untrained have volunteers <laughs> yeah as a matter of fact the mcdonough county um, emergency management had a chainsaw training um, seminar not too many years ago um, mm -hmm. to teach people how to do that um, but yes I, I keep telling people don't don't put a chainsaw in my husband's hands yeah. he will bleed somewhere terribly <laughs> so uh and for those trainings too, I, I hosted one oh many years ago also, and like that instructor has to be insured. You know they do not mess around with that chainsaw. I think in, in what he said, the chainsaw is one of the most dangerous tools anyone can just go get off the shelf and take home without any type of training. So um, it is a serious machine. Uh, and you know you saying that carry the chainsaw brigades. I, I do remember the. Uh, it was a hurricane that went through Florida and one of the, we will leave them unnamed, a big box store, handing out a semi-load of chainsaws to anybody who had walked by. And I'm like, no, and <laughs> I liability. Work with, <laughs> I work with people from Florida and we say the hashtag Florida man is a real, real true thing. Oh, that's a real don't, thing. Don't give people chainsaws that are untrained. <laughs> I used to live in Florida. <laughs> I can, I can <laughs> yeah, this is nobody's going to watch this outside of Illinois, right? <laughs> no, no, we don't. Just, just our parents, really. So, yeah. Good, good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, following flooding, which is another thing that we get a lot in Northern Illinois, um, there have been people calling asking about vegetable gardens that were flooded by a nearby creek. And they had tomatoes, beans, lettuce, herbs, and lots of other vegetables that were ready to pick um, before the flood. Is it safe to eat those? Yeah, so um, I would say no. So we don't know what is in that um, water that's being or that's surrounding our fruits and vegetables that we're going to eat. A lot of times that flood water can be contaminated with uh, things such as sewage, farm runoff, other pollutants. Um, and that's something that we definitely don't want to eat. So I would not suggest harvesting 
well, you can harvest it uh, and you could potentially compost it, um, but I would not consume it or eat it or give it away or anything. Yeah, I've, I've had people call and say, well, what if I dump it in bleach? Like, it's still Do you no. want to eat bleach? Yeah, you don't <laughs> want to eat bleach either, right? I think you've improved your circumstances. <laughs> right. Uh, another kind of flooding issue that has happened in northern Illinois is when floodwaters covered a backyard for over a week or, you know, down here along the Mississippi mm -hmm. for months on end. Um, now that the water is gone, the the lawn was covered with a fine silt and the glass grass looks terrible. How would someone go about fixing that? That's, that is a difficult situation. Now, the interesting thing about like a shallow flooded lawn is, you know, yes, the water is not helping. It is uh, pushing all of the air oxygen out of the soil so the roots can't breathe. But a, I think maybe even perhaps a, a larger issue here is that water gets hot when the sun comes out. And actually, it gets too hot for the for the, the grass there that it's uh, surrounding. And so there's no airflow. There's nothing. It's just in the stagnant hot pool of water. Uh, and there's no air in the roots. And so there's uh, a lot of issues developed from the saturated soil combined with warming water. So uh, this, that can be a big issue. Uh, usually, if say, if it would happen early, early spring, maybe late winter, and the lawn necessarily hasn't started growing yet, it might be fine. But very often this will happen in those mid to late spring, even in the summer, and then even the fall months too. Um, you know, if it's standing water for about eight days or longer, you, it's not a good chance that the lawn will survive that. Um, tall fescue, turf type tall fescue, it can tolerate more standing water than say Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, but, you know, after about a week, they're, they're both gonna be toast. Um, so, what, what can we do? I mean, the first thing issue there is the silt that's kind of deposited itself across the, the, the landscape there. Now, I, I wonder if that's something that could be raked up. I kind of doubt it because I feel like it would be kind of mucky, heavy. Um, so in, in light of that, the next thing I would propose would be getting oxygen back into that root zone there, even if there's no living grass yet. So hollow core aerating, so pulling the plugs physically out of the ground, get oxygen, back into the, the soil there, uh, probably then having to come in and top dress with some type of compost or topsoil mixture, uh, and then overseeding a, a fresh new lawn or, or resodding that area will, will probably have to be what's done because you know, lawn that is inundated over a long period of time uh, doesn't it will not tolerate that I'd say about until like you know if it's a week or longer. All right, switching from warm weather disasters to cold weather disasters during the winter ice storm in central Illinois in late 2020. Someone's arborvita hedge has branches that are dropping and touching the ground. The same with the white pine. Should they have gone out and knocked off the ice? No, so that's not something um, you want to do. You just kind of leave that ice there, let it thaw on its own. Um, knocking that ice off can do more damage to the trees than than would normally otherwise, and you also run the risk of that springing back up and and potentially hitting you. And you know, these these trees have evolved, you know, to kind of withstand this. That's why they're bending. Um, they can they can stand some of that. Um, and eventually, as that as that slowly thaws, they'll they'll perk back up eventually. And if you know they do break, um, you know, you just have to cut that out. Um, again, wait till that ice is gone, so you don't have to worry about damaging other branches and stuff. And and as a lay person, doesn't a, a thin amount of ice actually protect some plants? I, I have this foggy memory of people spraying water on fruit trees in Florida right before a, a freeze to help protect some of the fruit. So yeah, so when I was down in Florida um, for grad school, I was common thing if we got we would get a frost, especially with strawberries and stuff, where I was at in northern or northern Florida, um, they would run irrigation all night, <clears throat> and by freezing water, that water releases some heat and that protects uh, those flowers and stuff. And uh, one year, I don't, they dropped the water table 10, 15 feet because they were watering so much because um, we had a lot of several nights of of real cold weather. Um, we'll do that with citrus too, and to kind of protect that crop. And uh, there's I don't remember how much heat it gives off, but you know, as it freezes, it'll give off heat, but you have to continuously do that. If you do it and then stop, it'll get too cold and kill everything. So you have to keep, you're doing that spraying of that water on the, on those crops 
until it's above freezing. Yeah. All right. Water. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in the wintertime around here, it doesn't seem like a practical yeah. uh, thing to do. Well, and, and on the opposite extreme, um, you know, we are subject to a lot of variation. So there was a drought in 2012 and um, people started thinking about making their yards more sustainable. And one of the questions that was received was during the drought, um, they were on water restrictions and uh, people lost a lot of plants and couldn't keep a garden. Are there ways to make someone's yard more resilient to droughts? Yeah, there definitely are multiple different ways that we can do this. Um, so one thing that comes right to my mind is planting plants that are more tolerant to drought. Um, so some of our plants, we have like, um, a I would have a tap root. Um, so that's going to grow deeper into the ground and that's going to be able to scavenge any available water. Um, and that's some positives that we see with native plants as well as uh, so those plants um, are used to our climate here in the Midwest, and so they're easily able to adapt to our changing climate. And so something like a drought is something that they could tolerate as well. Uh, mulching in our, our gardens as well as our landscapes can really help. Uh, so that prevents evaporation from the soil as well as provides a layer uh, to keep moisture on our soil. And so that's also an idea to do um, for both your garden and your landscape. A more long-term thing I think you could do is uh, look at maybe amending your soil. So if you have a more sandy type of soil, you're going to lose moisture a lot quicker than say something like a clay or a loam soil. Um, so if you do have a sandy soil, you could potentially amend each year with compost and you can help build organic matter in your soil and that would help with soil retention during those dry times as well. Um, definitely being more efficient with our watering. So if you're watering just a little bit each day uh, to prevent wilting that you're seeing, that's not very efficient because we're promoting shallow root growth. And so if we water uh, for a longer period of time, less frequent, that is getting the water deeper into the soil profile, which promotes a deeper root growth. Um, and so in those drier times, our roots are growing deeper into the soil. And so again, we're able to scavenge water that's uh, further down in the soil profile that makes it available to the plants. Um, as for like your lawn, you're gonna probably want to not mow quite as much a lot of times during a drought, our lawns will go dormant and it's best just to allow that to happen. Um, you can also do more like back to the more efficiently watering. So you can, I would also suggest uh, watering like at the, the base of the plant. So the soil, you can either use that with just like watering cans or drip irrigation rather than doing an overhead sprinkler because we lose a lot of water um, with evaporation with the overhead sprinklers as well. You may also consider watering in the morning so that the water doesn't evaporate as quickly. Um, other than that, Chris, Ken, do you guys have any input? I agree with your let your lawn go dormant during those hot, dry times. Um, that and, and really, when you think about investment in your landscape and your home property, that lawn doesn't add that much value because it can be re-sown in a year. And, uh, but the tree, drought stress can be very detrimental to tree health. And so uh, it frustrates me because it got pretty dry last summer too. And people are out you know, with the overhead sprinklers on their lawns at like three o'clock in the afternoon, it's 90 some degrees and most of that water, water is evaporating before it even does a thing. Like stop watering the lawn, water your trees. It's, uh, you know, they, they need the water. Your lawn will be fine. And you could just plant more lawn seed if, if that comes to it. So yeah, I agree with let the lawn go dormant. And one thing I would say with, with our native plants, yeah, those are drought tolerant once you get them established. So I don't think you, you're gonna plant them that first year, they're gonna be drought tolerant. You need to, you'll need to water them and get them established before they really get 
um, that drought tolerance with them. Can you give me an idea of what some of those native plants are? Some, uh, you know, I've been, I've grown up in the Midwest, but I don't know which ones of our trees and, and plants are native and which we've imported. Well, I, I will just, I'll give a plug out for oak trees. Um, and so predominantly in our neck of the woods, the historic woodland area, uh, which would be in the bottomlands and the hillsides for us would have been oak hickory dominant forest. Uh, oak can be very drought tolerant, and there are some species that are more adapted to upland plantings as opposed to those bottomland plantings. Uh, so upland being more dry, bottomland usually being have, have a higher soil moisture level. Uh, so I will plug oak trees and I will unplug maple trees because even though maple might be native for parts of the state, we have too darn many being planted in our, our urban yards and landscapes. And so we're gonna run into the same thing that we did with the ash tree, chestnut, uh, elm. So we need to diversify a little bit. Um, and so if I could plug oak and unplug maple. Uh, so yeah, in terms of trees, that's, that's what I like. I don't know, Ken, Katie, are there any other plants you think of? I mean, there's all kinds. Uh, you could do columbine, false indigo, uh, milkweed species. Cornflowers. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the, the smaller bunch grasses, native grasses, can have some nice ornamental features, and those will be real deeply rooted as well. Yeah, and we actually have a publication through the Indiana Illinois Sea Grant uh, uh, called Native Plants, and it actually has a nice chart that tells you uh, flowering time, you know, what type of soil does it like, clay, loam, sand, all that. And then it has a little chart that says moisture. And if it likes high moisture soil, low moisture soil. And so then the more drought tolerant ones can survive those uh, dry soils. And I can put a link to that publication down below in the show notes. All right, well, that was a lot of fantastic information uh, to get us ready for another growing season of fun in the garden, but also being prepared for what might lie around the corner because we don't know. So Carrie McKillop, community and economic development educator, uh, here to talk to us today about uh, disaster preparedness, uh, you know, and also kind of response and mitigation. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for asking me. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Winnie Ferguson and edited by me, Chris Enroth. A thank you to our co-host with us every single week, Ken, not Ken Parker, ah, <laughs> Ken <laughs> Ken Johnson and Katie Parker, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, for joining us. And Chris and Ken, it's always a joy to see you. Yes, thank you, Carrie. And as always, thank you, Chris and Katie. And let's do this again in two weeks. Oh, we shall do this again in two weeks. We got next week off, but we're still going to be working. So it's not really off, but you know how that goes, folks. Uh, but in two weeks, we are going to be talking about snakes. Uh, yeah, it's going to be fun talking with Dr. John Van Eck about snakes, reptiles, all the things that slither and go uh, in the night. So, listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.